Greetings, and welcome back to room 303, the Harvard Classic Lectures. This is lecture number 102. We're in Thoreau's Walden, and we are working now in chapter 3 reading. Of course, Thoreau did not actually label these as chapters. They're just sections from a what really is a long essay. But for ease, scholars have often spoken about these as chapters, and we now are in the famous reading chapter. Now, we do have several assumptions as we begin our conversation. One is that at LearnStrong.net, in the Harvard Classics folder, you have at least worked with lectures 99 through 101, obviously precedent lectures, introductory lectures, as well as in the junior folder at LearnStrong.net. We have a number of lectures there specific to Thoreau and Walden to kind of help you to be able to have the background information that allows allows us to now just specifically look at the chapter on reading. Now, we also will assume that you're conversant with our understanding of the three levels of reading. At level one, what does the text say? At level two, what does the text mean? To a message is themes to be rhetoric, not what the row says, but how he says it. And then finally, at level three, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way at 3A other texts? And obviously, we'll be asking about what we have already read in Walden and how it relates to what it is that he's saying and reading. And of course, uh, other kinds of texts that we're familiar with as well. And then finally, at 3B, and most significantly, and I think this is true for Thoreau, I think if we were to have Thoreau here with us today, he would say, too much has been made in dogmatic terms about the things that I have said in my text Walden. I was being experimental all the way through. When I said I wish to live deliberately, I really meant I wish to live experimentally. And by that I meant I'm going to try things. If they work, I keep them. If they don't work, I don't. So to draw dogmatic conclusions about any of the things that I have to say, yeah, we should probably say that epistemologically, Thoreau was a fallibilist. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And it's that I could be wrong part that's so significant in our study and the ways in which we take the text personally. One of the ways I like to say this is if you can come up with a couple of great ideas that work for you, then your study and your reading of Walden will have been worth your time. Before, however, we become too critical of ideas, we obviously want to know those ideas, which leads us to the next observation, and it's really prescient when we get to this reading chapter. Namely, we are, we love to say this in 303, right? We are the stories that we tell. We are the stories we retell. We are, of course, the stories we accept, also, of course, the stories that we reject. Now, of course, Thoreau's going to do a lot of that accepting of some stories, rejecting of other stories. He's going to say some controversial things in every chapter in Walden. We're going to hear it here as well. And, of course, it is ironic to be talking about a chapter on reading living in a time when most people don't, don't read what, it, what are referred to as the classics by, by Thoreau. Um, and, and to that degree, we're going to have to ask, is there anything of value at all in, um, in, in reading about reading? Um, we think, of course, immediately of that great text in 303, Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book. We love that book for the same reason that we love this chapter on reading. Before we start to make assumptions, about Thoreau and about his views on reading, and of course the canon as it's often referred to, of course many of the dead white males that he will be referencing as classics from the Iliad on, we should probably pause for a moment and just take in exactly what it is that he's suggesting about the curious mind. And, and, and let's put it in our notes now. In every chapter in Walden, and I think this is a easily verifiable statement, in every chapter in Walden, Standing behind all of his comments is the exhortation to all of us to be curious, to be learners. He will call them lifelong learners in, in the end of, uh, of, uh, of the chapter of reading. Well, to begin, he's going to talk in this book, uh, in this chapter about literature. He's going to talk about books. He's going to talk about the inheritance, is the language he uses from the past, right? Obviously, it's great for the individual as the individual is somehow trying to gain wisdom. Standing behind so much of Walden, of course, is the great role model of Socrates. You can go and find our lectures on Plato's Republic and the, and the Apology and, else, and, other, and other dialogues of Plato at LearnStrong.net. That spirit uh, that, that's there in the Gorgias, right? That notion of um, when, when Callicles comes walking by, Socrates will say to him, we are engaged in a subject of such importance. And of course, Socrates and Thoreau do kind of come to mind as being gadflies first of Athens and then, of course, of Concord. And by definition, we hope gadflies to those of us in 303. He says that true works 
of classics, right, have certain kinds of universal meaning to all generations. Now this is of course the argument that we make in 303, that there are texts which continue to be of value, especially at our level three of reading, if we're capable of asking the right kinds of questions. These classics, of course, have to be read in the same way that he will talk about living deliberately, there must be reading that is deliberate. Right? Now he does critique the current taste and, of course, the inability by most people now to read in a what he calls high sense. That is to say, increasingly, he argues, people don't take the time to really try and figure out exactly what is being suggested in a text. We read, he says, the mediocre, and to that degree, it kind of dulls us in some way. Go back to what we were saying in Where I Lived and What I Lived For in Chapter 2. Uh, this idea that we have to learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn. Now, Thoreau's going to argue you can read with that attitude in mind, what we have called in, in 303 for many years our annotative process, discovery reading, yes? In other words, we pick up a text, we want to know what it says before we're going to argue whether we accept it or reject it. He finally says that if we read well, we can get rid of the narrowness, the ignorance, right? And this will, in many ways, motivate us to change, uh, and, and largely, obviously, change uh, within. Let's just turn now, and as I said uh, uh, already, I would love to read all of this chapter with you. I just, we just don't have the time. But let's at least hear a few of the lines, and let's play around with our big five of epistemology, what we can know, ontology, who we are, psychology, the motivations of the individual mind, sociology, that notion of we are, we are in a world where we live with other people, and then finally the question of theodicy, what's the point of the pain, the suffering in the world? He begins it this way. With a little more deliberation in the choice of their pursuits, all men would perhaps become essentially students and observers, for certainly their nature and destiny are interesting to all alike. In accumulating property for ourselves or our posterity, in founding a family or state or acquiring fame even, we are mortal. But in dealing with truth, we are immortal and need fear no change nor accident. Now this is an interesting idea. We worry so much about gaining posterity, gaining money, gaining fame uh, for mm, somehow a, a future that we never actually enjoy. He says, why don't we spend time worrying about finding wisdom, something that can, all, can, can really help us. A few lines later he says, my residence He's talking now about where he lived in his hut. My residence was more favorable not only to thought but to serious reading than a university. And, and of course, this is one of Thoreau's greatest critiques. If you're going to university and you're not enjoying a whole lot of ideas that challenge you, that wake you up, then you're probably wasting your time. And he says often, I could get a whole lot more done outside of a classroom than inside of a classroom. He says, and though I was beyond the range of the ordinary circulating library, I had more than ever come within the influence of those books which circulate around the world, whose sentences were first written on bark and now merely copied from time to time onto linen paper. Now, put it in your notes. This is a huge exhortation for Thoreau. You've got to be a worldwide reader. Don't just read within your own culture. Read outside of your culture. And of course, we in America, we struggle with this, don't we? We expect South Koreans to know American literature but unfortunately, we don't expect American students to know the tremendously valuable literature of Korea or any number of other cultures, right? He says, the student may read Homer or Aeschylus in the Greek without danger of dissipation or luxuriousness, for it implies that he in some measure emulate their heroes and consecrate morning hours to their pages. The heroic books, even if printed in the character of our mother tongue, will always be in a language dead to degenerate times, and we must laboriously seek the meaning of each word in line, conjecturing a larger sense than common use permits out of what wisdom and valor and generosity we have. I think it's a brilliant insight, and I think it's an insight that we have to remind ourselves today. Whatever it is we're reading, we have to come with it to, to it with some gentleness. Remember that Emily Dickinson will say in that opening line to the reader, uh, judge tenderly of me. We, we need to show a bit of grace when we pick up a text to read it for the first time. 
Of course, if we can read it in the original Thoreau, we'll say that's even better. But because we live in a degenerate time that's no longer interested in, if you will, for Thoreau, the classics, the wisdom of a prior time, we lose a lot. We lose a lot. Because, of course, we are the stories that we tell. We're also the stories we accept and we reject. And often, these stories that are rejected, we have to reclaim them in some way. Of course, we have a name for that during history, and we call that the Renaissance, don't we? That rediscovery. He says it this way. He says... But the adventurous student, and I love that term, that's what we're all to do, right? We're the adventurous student. I mean, T.S. Eliot will say it in his four quartets, he's Coker, old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving. I think it's true of all students, right? The adventurous student will always study classics in whatever language they may be written and however ancient they may be. For what are the classics but the noblest recorded thoughts of man? And we would say here, he says, man, of course, it's not that he was uh, not thinking of women as well, but of course, he, he lives in a time where most of the authors, writers, artists are in fact male. We would say today, with Tilly Olson in her classic essay, Silences, there's a reason why few women were writing up to the time of Thoreau. But it's in large measure because of Thoreau, I would argue, that many, many women were allowed to have that voice and to begin to proclaim their views as well as being so so important, so critical. we got to read them. So what is a classic? Well, he's obviously going to spend a little time trying to give us a definition of what he means by a classic. He says, we might as well admit to study nature because she's old if you don't want to read good books. To read well, that is, to read true books in a true spirit, is a noble exercise and one that will task the reader more than any exercise which the customs of the day esteem. I, I've told the story before of a prof that I, that I, I was a, a affiliated with on the first day he said it out loud. It's harder to think for an hour than it is to dig a ditch for a day. And one of my colleagues said out loud, clearly you've never dug a ditch for a day. And we all kind of laughed at the fact that he was a bookworm instead of knowing real work. And then when we finally all stopped laughing, he said, and I can tell you've never thought for an hour. Ouch. But I think there's some beautiful generosity in the way in which he responded. And here it is. We've got to learn. It's a noble exercise. It will take work but I think it's probably for us still today worth it. Notice he, he goes to a word picture that many of us appreciate. It requires a training such as the athletes underwent, the steady intention almost of the whole life to this object. Most books must be read as deliberately, using the very language of the last chapter, and reservedly as they were written. It's not enough even to be able to speak the language of that nation by which they are written, for there is a memorable interval between the spoken and the written language. He will say a few lines later, the, to those who can hear him, the writer whose more equitable life is his occasion, and who would be distracted by the event and crowd which inspires the orator, speaks to the intellect and heart of mankind, to all in any age who can understand him. Of course, our, our reading theory always ends. Our annotative theory always ends with that level three question, how can I personally relate to this? If we're trying to do anything in our discussions in 303, it's to find a way to relate to the old ideas so that we can see them as new ideas. As we say in 303, the new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. He continues, no wonder that Alexander carried the Iliad with him on his expeditions in a precious casket. A written word is the choicest of relics. And we've given, of course, full lectures on every book of the Iliad. And I would hope that if you haven't been exposed to the Iliad, you might want to go to LearnStrong.net and find those lectures. The argument that I've made in those lectures is, no, no, the Iliad is a powerful poem for all time, as all great works of literature are. I mean, I think we're going to be arguing here in 200 years that you need to pick up the color purple Alice Walker's classic and read it. It will still speak to a time of another time. I think it's important that we recognize classic works like the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, Dante's Inferno. Here, the Iliad is mentioned, and of course, it's a text that we're told he brought with him to the woods. It's something at once, the Iliad, once more intimate with us and more universal than any other work of art. It's the work of art nearest to life itself. He says a few lines later, the symbol of an ancient man's thought becomes a modern man's speech. 
2,000 summers have imparted to the monuments of Grecian literature as to her marbles, only a mature, golden, and autumnal tint, for they have carried their own serene and celestial atmosphere into all lands to protect them against the corrosion of time. Books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. We, of course, think about the end of Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451. For those of you who love the movie Book of Eli, that notion that books are an inheritance. And we, and we need to honor that fact, the stories that have come with us. The books, he says it this way, books, the oldest and the best, stand naturally and rightfully on the shelves of every cottage. They have no cause of their own to plead, but while they enlighten and sustain the reader, his common sense will not refuse them. Their authors are a natural and irresistible aristocracy in every society, and more than kings or emperors exude an influence on mankind. He says a few lines later, those who have not learned to read the ancient classics in the language in which they were written must have a very imperfect knowledge of the history of the human race. And it's true. I mean, we challenge ourselves, obviously, to try and find the best that we can in terms of translations if we can't read in the original Greek or Latin. He does say, Homer's never yet been printed in English, nor Aeschylus nor Virgil even works as refined as solidly done and as beautiful almost as the morning itself. Well, we would argue that while there's probably some great truth to that, we do have some amazing translations now that we can work with. He continues, he says that the um, that the, Vat the Vatican shall be filled with Vedas and Saravatas and Bibles with Homer's and Dante's and Shakespeare's and all the centuries to come shall have successfully deposited their trophies in the form of the world by such a pile we may hope to scale heaven at last. The works of the great poets have never yet been read by mankind for only great poets can read them. Now this seems obviously a, a, a little bit duplicitous. He says we should all be reading books but in the end only the great writers and great poets can really truly read. That is completely understand. One of the points I want to make here is that Thoreau was a great believer in world texts. All of the texts, not just the text of the West, should be experienced and enjoyed. He says it uh, this way, reading as a noble intellectual exercise, they know little or nothing. He's obviously critiquing. Yet this only is reading in a high sense, as he calls it, not that which lulls us as a luxury and suffers the noble faculties to sleep the while, but what we have to stand on tiptoe to read and devote our most alert and wakeful hours to. This notion of standing on tiptoe to read is a great word picture. It's, of course, what we are witnessing even in our modern culture right now, where longer kinds of conversations, we think of three-hour podcasts, for example, where people are actually listening to this. Some people will say, I'm so shocked that somebody would listen for three hours. Thoreau would say, no, no, you can't be shocked by that. The human mind longs to be awakened, longs to be challenged, to stand on tiptoes. If a class does anything well for you in 303, it makes you stand on tiptoes. That is to say, we're always trying to teach three inches above your head, challenge you in some way. The best books, he says later, are not read even by those who are called good readers. What does our Concord culture amount to? There is in this town, with very few exceptions, no taste for the best or for very good books, even in English literature, whose words all can read and spell. Even the college-bred and so-called liberally educated men here and elsewhere have really little or no acquaintance with the English classics and so for the recorded wisdom of mankind, the ancient classics and Bibles which are accessible to all who will know of them. There are the feeblest efforts anywhere made to become acquainted with them. I love that he challenges us to pick up all of the religious texts of the world, not just the ones that we're familiar with. You, we will sometimes hear, of course, Christians speaking about what's in the Islamic Quran, and when you ask them, where in the Quran have you read that? They will say, well, I've never actually read the Quran. I don't even need to read the Quran to know what's in it. And of course, Muslims will sometimes make the same error in their comments regarding, for example, the Christian Bible. They're thoroughly convinced what's in the Christian Bible, and you ask them, where in the Bible have you actually read that? Well, I've never actually read the Bible. The rebels say, why don't we become educated? Why don't we read all of the religious texts of the world? Not with a judging eye, right? But with an open eye, with a a fallibilist epistemological eye. He will say it this way about the sacred texts. The sacred scriptures are Bibles of mankind. Who in this town can tell me even their titles? He says, most men do not know that any nation but the Hebrews have, a, have had a scripture. 
of course, challenging us to pick up the sacred texts of other, of other um, cultures and read them. Read the Bhagavad Gita, of course, a text that Thoreau took with him to Walden. Read uh, uh, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, and, and we've given lectures at Bernd Strong on any number of these religious texts. He says, I aspire to be acquainted with wiser men than this our Concord soil has produced, whose names are hardly known here. Or shall I name, uh, or shall I hear the name of Plato and never read his book. Um, I've had any number of students that say, you know, I've always heard this name Plato and I never knew anything about him, and so it's time probably for me to pick up a, uh, the Republic or the Apology and read it. That, that is absolutely true. He says it, we're underbred and low-lived and illiterate. And in this respect, he says, I confess, I do not make any very broad distinction between the illiterateness of my townsman who cannot read at all and the illiterateness of him who has learned to read only what is for children and feeble intellects. We should be as good as the worthies of antiquity, but partly by first knowing how good they were. We are a race of titmen and soar but little higher in our intellectual flights than the columns of the daily paper. And then he says one of the famous quotes from Walden. It is not all books that are as dull as their readers. There are probably words addressed to our condition exactly, which if we could really hear and understand, would be more salutary than the morning or the spring to our lives and possibly put a new aspect on the face of things for us. How many a man has dated a new error in his life from the reading of a book? The book exists for us perchance, which will explain our miracles and reveal new ones, the at present unutterable things we may find somewhere uttered. These same questions that disturb and puzzle and confound us have in their turn occurred to all the wise men. Not one has been omitted, and each has answered them according to his ability, by his words and his life. Moreover, with wisdom we shall learn liberality. If we really want to become truly human, we have to ask the simple question, when will a book help you awaken to a new time in your life? Maybe Walden will be that for you as well. He says...